we talk a lot about cabinets here at Obsessed Garage, and it's really for good reason, because other than the car in your garage, uh, it's really one of the biggest purchases, usually, you know, depending on the size of your space and, and what you're doing with your garage or shop. But it really becomes the center point where, you know, when you open your garage door or walk into the space, that's what you see. That's what takes your attention, whether it houses, uh, you know, your TV setup or your audio or you have, you know, some kind of other feature going on in your garage, your eyes will always gravitate towards the biggest thing in the garage. Um, and usually that's the cabinets, especially when we're dealing with a striking looking cabinet like Sonic MSS Plus. Another reason cabinets are such a big focus is because it's, what's, it's what holds your life in your garage, all of your tools, all of your equipment, all of your uh, consumables, um, anything that you're using in your garage goes in the cabinet. So often we want to have the space look super clean and really just uh, hide everything away and have, you know, the old adage is, is uh, a place for everything and everything in its place. And without cabinets, you can't really do that. Like you have to have a place for your tools and a place for your car parts and your nuts and bolts and zip ties and you know all of that stuff, all of your, your chemicals that you use to clean the car and that sort of thing, even household items or yard equipment. We all wanna be able to hide it away and have a really nice clean look for the most part. And that's where cabinets come in and really give us an opportunity to create a super clean and tidy space. Hey guys, I'm Kyle. I am the design director here at Obsessed Garage. And today we're gonna do a garage walkthrough on Bill's garage. The focus is heavily gonna be on the cabinets because he has a pretty unique setup here with cabinets pretty much on every, every wall, um, except for, I guess, the very front wall, but you know, there's not really much space there. But this is a unique garage. Uh, because it's not really car focused. So it's a little different than um, what we're used to, but it was a really cool project to work on. And I wanna really focus in on, on the cabinets with this design, but we'll, we'll show you, you know, how we had to incorporate the, the fridge and um, you know, the audio and some of the other items, um, the table saw and stuff like that. So I think uh, this is a garage that hopefully you can relate to even if you're not doing as many cabinets or even if you're planning on doing car stuff and not necessarily, you know, motorcycle and ATVs and stuff like that, like Bill is. This can be something that you can use to pull some ideas from and, uh, you know, will help you design, you know, the cabinets for your space as well. And we'll talk about some of the things that, that Bill brought to us and said, hey, I want to do this, this, and this, that we kind of had to change a little bit and make sure that we were on the same page with, um, you know, where everything was going, the dimensions that were being used, and really make sure that everything was going to fit properly because there were some certain things that we had to take into consideration. So let's take a look at the, the floor plan here. Um, so in Bill's garage, like I said, he was not planning on doing any car work. He's got these two garage doors here that because of the space and everything and how he's laid this out, it's really making this more bike focused and more um, ATV focused. And, and I think he's got some dirt bikes and motorcycles and stuff like that too. The idea was to make this a really functional space for working on his bikes, storing some of the bikes, uh, ATVs and all of that. So you'll see that, you know, in this space here in the front, yeah, there's not really room to even bring a car in there. And he had some requirements to some of the other items that he wanted to be able to fit in there. 
So some of his, his goals were to have cabinets on every wall with a specific purpose and be able to do all of the things that he wanted to do in terms of projects and woodworking and working on the bikes and stuff like that. So let's talk about um, this left wall first. So you can see we've got the um, table saw over here in the corner. That was a requirement that he had. He gave us the dimensions and everything of, of that table saw. And that was something that we needed to account for and work into the plan. You'll also notice that on the back of his garage, he's got this step. And because we're doing this wraparound design with the cabinets going around, we really had to pay close attention to dimensions and make sure that things were gonna fit properly. He worked up the design um, himself in terms of you know which cabinets he thought the layout worked for but we really had to kind of do some different ideas with how to manage the step up versus the corner and how everything was going to fit into that space uh, but this side over here was going to be more of his like workshop side so to speak so he's got the table saw he's got the vice on the corner i believe he ended up going with you know one of our orange vices he wanted to do the uh, portable cabinets, which are awesome. You can fit a ton of tools in there. Plenty of light from the under cabinet lighting that we have in the store. So it really created a, a really nice focused work area on this left side where he can work on his bikes and stuff like that. For storing his bicycles, he actually has like a mobile setup that he's going to um, have basically right in the middle. It's like this big rack system that can roll around. I'm not exactly sure what it looks like or how he's going to implement it and, and where he's going to keep it all the time, but I do believe that it's going to be, you know, right in this area between the garage doors. Since he's not parking a car in there, you know, it's still plenty of space to be able to work on everything. And then he can, um, you know, work on a bike while it's hanging on the rack or pull it over onto the workbench area if he, if he wants to. The back wall of the garage up on the step, as you can see, is a little bit more multimedia focused. It's probably gonna be a little bit more of the uh, general items, nuts and bolts, uh, maybe some household stuff, things like that, that, um, you know, bike parts and that sort of thing. Uh, these 1540 cabinets that, you know, we've talked about at nauseum uh, are fantastic for holding up plethora of different types of items. So we incorporated uh, Core 59s, a Core Sub, um, with I believe the C658 from NAD. And since we're in the process of building out these um, uh, packages for the garage, we've got you know the the audio solutions. We're working on doing you know cabinet solutions and stuff like that as well. This one is obviously a custom type of setup with the cabinets. Um, but he was able to pick and choose certain solutions that we already had, like a foam inlay set from Sonic. We went with the, the basic MSS Plus version. He did the ultimate Dynaudio uh, studio monitor setup with the, the core sub here. He also did one of the, I think it was one of the advanced uh, Milwaukee setups for um, automotive use and that sort of thing. So that way he's getting like a, a good, well-rounded set without having to, you know, go crazy and do the full master collection for, for everything. Obviously he wanted to take those funds and spend them on the cabinets. On the right side, we've got some uh, locker storage as well as a sink. And he wanted really to be able to um, include his fridge in this setup. It's kind of funny because uh, he, he had this left over, um, I believe it was a Sub-Zero, Wolf Sub-Zero fridge that was left over from a previous home. So it's obviously way overkill for this garage, but it, it fit perfect in the scheme. The size was really good actually for the uh, for matching up with the Sonic MSS Plus cabinets. Um, and we were able to make it fit in, in the space. Um, so it worked out really well. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, dimensions and, and all of that. So this back corner was where we, we struggled the most with the, uh, the Sonic MSS Plus cabinets because in Bill's 
sketch that he sent us. He, he did a very you know, simple sketch on some graph paper, which is fantastic. Anytime uh, you're designing your garage yourself, or even if you're gonna have us design your garage and you're gonna send you know, something to us, you don't have to be an artist or a, a drafter or um, an engineer or anything like that to, to send us something that's helpful. Um, or even for your own plans, you can come up with something that is very basic but gets the point across. As long as you have the dimensions on there and you can um, you know, add everything up and make sure that everything is gonna fit. He was going based off of the width dimensions and then the listed spec for depth. Each of these cabinets along this left wall is an 890 millimeter cabinet. That is the actual width of the cabinet. So that's easy enough to figure out from a width standpoint. This one that's actually up on top of the step here is a 360 millimeter cabinet. And then the corner cabinet is a uh, 1060 millimeter cabinet along the left side back portion and the right side back portion. So it actually creates kind of a big square if you were to uh, you know, fill in the, the corner section. So it's 1060 by 1060. Whenever we're doing a cabinet array and we're trying to plan out you know, how much length we're gonna take up if we're doing a corner setup, uh, on the left side and then how much length we're gonna take up on the right side, you actually need to use a different dimension than just the actual cabinet itself because we have back panels and posts that go on the back of the cabinets. And then you have to have a little bit of space for you know the wall basically or baseboard or being able to install the posts like you've seen in, in some of the installation videos that we've done. So really that cabinet is actually going to be off the left wall back here, um, about probably three and a half inches, three to three and a half inches when it's all said and done. Um, and then off that right wall, three to three and a half inches. So what that does is that changes, you know, if you're just planning on it being, you know, a thousand and sixty millimeters from that wall to where the edge of the cabinet ends, and then you base the rest of your array off of that, you're going to be, you know, three to four inches off when it comes time to actually install and the, where that end of the cabinet is going to be because of the back panels and because of accounting for the wall and a baseboard and stuff like that. So you need to add uh, 50 millimeters onto the the back side of each cab, you know, each side, the left and the right of that corner cabinet, plus another like half inch. So that works out to be roughly you know, two and a half to three inches, I think, um, is, is usually what it comes out to be. So the, the front to back dimension of these cabinets without the, the back panels and stuff like that is 650 millimeters. So it's 25.6 inches, basically. If you add the back panel and the post onto that, it makes it pretty much dead even at 27, 27, um, oh, I'm sorry, 27 and a half, or 27 and 9 sixteenths is, is technically where it's at. 27 and a half inches really becomes 28 to 28 and a half inches from the actual wall to the front of the cabinet. So you always gotta account for that when you're doing a corner array and making sure that everything is gonna line up properly. When Bill put this together, he knew that he would have a difference in the way that the um, the cabinets lined up here because of the step. So we really had to get creative with how is this going to really work? Because this is a, a single cabinet here. This is a 360 millimeter cabinet. This side's gonna be able to have its feet on the step, but this side over here is not. Um, so I think the plan was that he's going to block underneath with um, some wood and then just paint it gray or paint it black uh, to be able to have the the cabinet sit on something still and still look okay and not look funky because of oh, you just got some random wood under there or something like that when he did his design that cabinet was going to be all the way onto the step because of his dimensions that he was using because he basically thought he had another you know three to three and a half inches to use when in fact it actually extended off because of the back panels and posts that we're talking about 
So you have to really pay attention to that to make sure that you're using the, the, the right starting point for when you're building out your array to the right and the left to make sure that the dimensions are gonna be accurate. This bridge unit that is right here underneath uh, the countertop and above the portable cabinet, obviously in our, our render here, it's not exact. Um, normally that would attach via some screws to the screw holes in the top of the 360 millimeter cabinet. But since we're having this step and we're having to bring it down, he's actually going to be just drilling some new holes in the side of the cabinet and, and mounting it with some uh, you know, screws that he already had, some metal screws or maybe some bolts with uh, a nut and a bolt and a washer uh, would be ideal. Um, I'm not sure exactly how he plans to do it. He's also going to brace the post behind the cabinet that usually just kind of hovers above the ground because you have cabinets to attach it to. Well, since there's no real cabinet structure to the side that it can attach to, he's going to have to block underneath that post to give it some support uh, to make sure that it's you know well supported all the way up so this entire array is nice and secure and solid. One of the other things that he thought of to really make sure that this one is gonna have enough um, rigidity since there is not the welded um, screw holes in this spot is he's going to do a, a little bit of angle iron underneath that bridge unit. It won't be in the way of the of the portable cabinet as it slides in, but it'll be just enough to brace the side of the cabinet and that bridge unit so that it it's nice and sturdy on there. And that you know if he's working on something on this workbench, he doesn't have to worry about. Uh, you know, throwing something heavy, you know, a transfer case or some kind of, um, you know, engine part or something like that onto that area that it's going to be fully supported. So that was one of the, the bigger things that we, you know, had to take into consideration when, when putting this array together. And then also that meant that he was going to have less room because now all of this has shifted to the left. He was going to have less room for his um, table saw and anything else that he wanted to put over here. And originally, you know, he thought that he was going to have more room in this front section so that this table saw wasn't going to be as crowded uh, towards the door. Had the table saw been any bigger or had there been another piece of equipment that was planned there, it really would have been pretty difficult to fit if he had already accounted for that three inches being there that we actually lost because the cabinet array had to extend further down. And then same thing with the top section here. We had to really make sure that this opening for, you know, if you're coming in from the house um, to enter into the garage, uh, when he did his drawing, because it was going to be another three and a half inches that way, he had a little bit more room. So we had to adjust this side as well so that it wasn't right up on the step or right up to the step because then this opening for the for the door would be you know too close so when you're doing your your cabinet layout that's those are things that you got to take in consideration to make sure that your walking paths are going to be free that they're going to be plenty wide that if you're going to need to push something through that area that it's not going to be um, you know, too sharp or, you know, say you have, um, you know, daily driver parking in your garage and you're going to be bringing in groceries and stuff like that. You really want to make sure that you have enough space between your cabinets to walk and, and all of that safely without having to, you know, bang into things and, and all of that. The core sub is going to be a little tight in that spot. Um, it's, it's probably the best place for it, but it did get pushed a little bit more towards that door because of um, you know, having to extend those cabinets further out because of the back panels and posts and everything. Let's talk about what we had to do with figuring out compressed air for this garage. We had to get a little bit tricky with this front area because of where he's going to be storing his bicycles and um, what he was planning for this area at first he was talking about doing like a faux wall and storing you know the rakes and everything back there um, he may still do something like that but originally we planned on just putting the reels up on 
the wall. And with everything that he was gonna have there and having the bike storage kind of go all the way to the wall, it didn't really work um, in that spot. So we instead decided to bring the reels out onto the ceiling, bring them further into the room so that they would uh, be able to be accessed a little bit easier if he's storing the bikes you know, right in this area. Um, even if it extends out into the middle, uh, it'll still be easy enough to reach up and grab above the bikes to, to get the air reel, and then he can easily move that bike system out of the way if he needs to. We had to get pretty tricky with supplying the air, though. And we do this in a lot of the garages, and, and you can kind of you know plan this out for yourself as well. We ended up putting the Werther compressor in the cabinet. I believe we did the P120, which has a little bit higher CFM at, I think it's like, four, 4.2 or something like that. The P50 is, is much quieter, but it has about half the CFM. It's only like 2.1. So that's fine for like blowing out interiors and filling tires and stuff like that. But if you want a little bit more oomph, going with the PC120 is a better idea. Um, it's still pretty quiet, uh, but it's going to give you that little bit extra output. Both of them are six gallon tanks. If you're just gonna be filling tires like, like Bill is and doing bike stuff and you know, blowing, blowing off um, you know, projects and stuff like that, uh, a lot of times just a smaller compressor makes a lot of sense. And we can still do some air distribution with, with Prevost throughout and really get a pretty nice setup and even do more than one reel if you wanted to. You know, all of that Prevost really just becomes extra tank capacity, so to speak. Um, so it's really not too much for the compressor to drive. With the Sonic cabinets, it gives us an opportunity and in, in using a smaller compressor like that where we can hide it away, you know, back to what we were talking about with cabinets being such a focus and being able to hide everything away and have a place for everything. You could do the same thing with your compressor. The corner cabinet makes a pretty good option for that. You have to get a little tricky with how you kind of manage the piping and the hoses and stuff like that for actually getting to the Prevost piping versus like a tall locker cabinet. You just you know drill a hole in the back and you can access out the back. Um, it's a little trickier to figure out with the, the back panel and all that stuff. I think what we ended up doing was a couple T junctions inside the cabinet as well as a valve. So that way he can reach in there and shut it off if he needs to, to isolate the compressor and pull it out and you know change the oil and that sort of thing. But it sits just far enough off the wall, but not too far to where it'll fit pretty much right in between the, um, the, like the back edge and the front edge of that back panel. Now that I'm thinking about the, the T junctions and everything that we were doing in there, we're actually utilizing a real cabinet for this 360 millimeter. We don't have a, a render of that, but uh, this one was going to house and it's big enough to where you can stack a air hose reel and a power cord reel on top of each other in that cabinet. You have to get a little tricky with your DIY stuff, uh, with you know drilling, drilling holes and stuff like that to be able to feed in from the front or the, the side uh, for your air and all of that. But if it's not a project that you're too scared of, you can take it on and actually create a really cool setup. So this is gonna be a really cool integrated air situation with an otherwise kind of difficult cabinet to store items in. Uh, the, the corner cabinet is super high capacity. You can fit a lot of stuff in it, but it's a little more difficult to get in there and access that stuff once it's in there. Um, it, it has two shelves and it's huge, but it's, you know, once you put things in there, it's way down in there and it's difficult to access sometimes. Using it for a compressor like this really then makes a good use of the space where you don't have to access that compressor all the time. Uh, maybe just to flip the switch to turn it off or on. Um, or if you have a really good setup with no leaks or whatever, you could leave it on if you wanted to, but I would still probably turn it off. But it's not too hard to access uh, to just reach in there and hit the switch real quick. But it makes a really good uh, storage solution for that compressor. And there's enough ventilation to where, you know, you don't have to worry about heat or anything like that. So that was a fun, a fun little thing to figure out with 
uh, really how to make this work together. So if you're designing your own garage and you're planning on doing an air solution, whether it's you know a bigger compressor or going with something like one of the smaller Werther's, don't be afraid to put it inside of a cabinet. For a lower cabinet, you would have to use one of the doored cabinets. Obviously, it's not going to fit in a drawer, but um, you know the the 1060 corner cabinet, an 890 double door, or a 720 single door uh, would work great if you wanted to put it in a lower cabinet, especially if you have like an adjacent 360 millimeter um, hose reel cabinet, or you can put it in the 650 or 965 millimeter um, you know, tall locker if you wanted to do that as well. That's normally how we spec it out. If we're going to hide a compressor in a cabinet, we'll put it either at the bottom or you could put it at the top you know, up in the, the top shelf if you wanted to do that. Uh, just keep in mind, you're gonna be modifying the cabinet to make that happen so that you can, you know, have routing for the hoses and pipe and stuff like that. You'll notice it's a little funky looking on, on this back wall because of this 360 millimeter cabinet here. Really, that's more just to, to fill space and to make sure that his TV was going to fit. So he's got, you know, the full height back panels above the 360 millimeter and the 890 millimeter six drawer. And it really worked out perfect. I think this is a 55 inch TV. Yeah, 55 inch TV uh, fits perfectly in that spot and you can really make it look nice and integrated. If you're looking at from you know the side or something like that, obviously it's gonna be a little bit blocked depending on what kind of mount you do. How this gets tricky though, and you need to kind of think about this and sort this out uh, from another DIY standpoint, you don't want to mount your TV mount, unless it's a much smaller TV or really lightweight, you don't wanna mount it directly to the back panel without doing any sort of modification, unless you have a back panel that ends up right in the middle, like we did in the Atlanta project. In that situation, we actually modified the TV mount and drilled it you know, right into that back panel uh, or that post. Um, and that really worked out pretty good. The post is going to be a little bit more sturdy than just the back panel, which is, you know, a bare sheet of metal, basically. So there's not as much bracing. For a situation like this, where there's going to be an offset post, so, you know, we'll have a, a 100 by 50 by 1997 post here to go between the cabinets and the back panels. And then we'll have another one here between these cabinets. And then there's gonna be another one between this 360 and the 890 cabinet. So that post is gonna be offset. So this space here in the middle is really gonna be on that nine, 890 millimeter back panel um, that's gonna be behind the 890 millimeter cabinet. What we've had some clients do in the past is actually just brace behind it with some two by fours or uh, two by sixes or something like that. So just get creative with um, you know, a DIY project and, and put some wood backing back there to make sure that you're really getting it nice and secure and not just trusting that that back panel is going to hold it because that's not really what these are for. They're not really supposed to be a structural thing. They're really more of a, um, a visual aspect of the, the cabinet array and just finishing everything off. So that is gonna work out really well for him. Uh, that TV is gonna fit perfect. And then of course, you know, we talked about the Dyn Audio setup that he did on that back wall too with the Core 59s and the Core Sub. A lot of times with sinks, we, we will either spec shelving above it or an upper cabinet. Uh, in this situation, originally, we planned on doing, you know, just some stainless shelves above. And you can do that with a back panel that goes all the way up and actually put the stainless shelves on that back panel. Again, you're going to need to brace that probably. Or you can do a short back panel and then just mount your shelving to the wall if you wanted to do that. Kind of depends on how integrated you want the entire setup to look. In the end, uh, Bill, I think, made the right choice to just do another upper cabinet. Because we have this entire, um, you know, roughly seven foot high, or I think it's like 82 inches, you know, we have this 82 inch kind of black wall going all the way across the entire garage so it made more sense to go ahead and finish that off and continue that and do just another upper cabinet above the sink plus that'll provide lighting with our spec'd out under cabinet lighting 
So I think in the end, it was the right choice. Um, I do like having the open shelving sometimes. Uh, if, you know, say we're doing a pressure washer setup and we're gonna do a, uh, a tall locker for holding detailing supplies and then a uh, 720 waste bin or the 890 millimeter sink. In those situations when it's more detailing focused, I do like to put the shelves above because then you can put your press, press all bottles on it and, and that sort of thing. And it looks pretty good. We actually did that in um, our first garage giveaway that we did. We, we put some shelving right above that sink and it worked out pretty well. I think it looked, looked really good. Uh, in this situation, I think just the upper cabinet was the best choice to kind of just give that consistency, you know, all the way around. We've got the three lockers over here for holding, you know, larger um, parts and stuff like that for his bikes and ATVs and helmets and that sort of thing, as well as, you know, just general household items are gonna fit in there really well. Again, uh, the Sub-Zero fridge fit perfectly in that spot. And, and with this, he did have his dimensions correct. Uh, you know, he was just going off of the width. And the width, if you're not including a you know, corner cabinet or whatever, is going to be exact. So we've got 890 millimeters and then three times 965 millimeters. With these, it is gonna be exact. This comes out to be a little bit over 12 feet um, and that's what that system was going to be. So he planned for that and that ended up working out you know, exactly as he had planned. So he had enough room for the fridge. We did, like I said, you know, we had to move it off the, sh off the uh, not the shelf, but the, um, the step a little bit just to make room for walking through and stuff. But there was still enough room uh, that we had to play with that it, it worked out okay. We did get a little bit uh, more creative with the, the flooring. Um, in our software, we can't get too granular with it because really to do all of these extra tiles and stuff like that, um, we actually have to create a separate room. So this is a room, this is a room, this is a room, this is a room, so on and so forth. So to do like, you know, alternating tiles along this side or something like that, it, it's a little too, uh, too difficult to do in our, in our software. And then it just becomes a mess from a visual standpoint, looking at this. But what he ended up doing was he took this border and instead of doing just the black border or even just the black border with the blue uh, corners, he did an alternating blue and black, blue and black, blue and black, all the way across, which normally we don't do, especially if you're gonna be having a lot of, you know, a, a parking space for a car or something like that, because then what, you know, what do you do if you, uh, you know, you change the color of your car or something like that? You can replace tiles, but we just, we like to keep it simple. Bill wanted to get a little bit more creative with it. So he wanted to do that alternating, um, you know, kind of look for the edge. So, you know, it was blue, black, blue, black, so on and so forth, um, which, you know, it's going to look cool. Um, it's not something that we normally do, but, um, you know, everybody has their own taste. And if you want to do, you know, something like that, it's totally fine. Uh, as long as you're not doing checkerboard, we're, we're okay with it. So really in the end, you know, this garage is, is super awesome. I think we've, you know, done a pretty good job with this. Um, the other, you know, last thing that I want to talk about are the countertops. When you're planning out your space uh, and you're doing, you know, Sonic MSS or MSS Plus or even Sabre cabinets, really think about how the cabinet seams or the, the top seams are going to work with how you're laying everything out. You know, if you're gonna have a TV in, in one area um, and that's gonna be like a focus spot, well, it would kinda stink to have a seam like right there in that middle, middle area. So pay attention to what the available sizes are and how it's going to lay out so that you can really make it work best. If we were doing this setup and doing stainless tops, it would have been a little funky because this would be able to have a single top over it to cover the 1540 and the 890. But Sonic doesn't make a top that spans multiple 
or or like a you know 1540 and a 360 like that that top doesn't exist so what ends up having to happen is you have to do an individual top on top of that 360 millimeter cabinet which kind of stinks you wouldn't even be able to do a single cat a single top to cover the 890 millimeter and the 360. So what you have to do is you do the, you know, 1540 plus a 890 top. Um, and then you have to do an individual 360. And then you have to do an individual 1540 individual corner cabinet because there is no top that extends past the corners. And then an, another individual top on top of the 360. And then over on this other, other wall, it's, you know, it's fine. You'd end up with two individual tops to cover, you know, all four of those. So in the end, we chose to go with wood. That way we could get a little bit more creative. And keep in mind that if, if we're designing your garage or if you're designing your cabinet array yourself and you wanna do wood tops and have a seam in a certain way, just reach out and let us know. We can, we can help you do that for the wood tops because um, we can work with our supplier to do custom stuff. We can do anything we want and they can make it for us so if we wanted to have a top that really you know covered this 360 millimeter and the corner cabinet and this 1540 you know we could do that um it would have a a field joint seam so they still have like the uh the biscuit joints and everything and the the clamps that allow it to uh really cinch together really well so that way when you get it it doesn't have to ship in this giant L and cost you, you know, a million dollars to ship it. And they can ship it in two separate pieces, which is much cheaper. And then you can put it together yourself. You can glue it if you want to, to really create a nice sturdy uh, seam. But it, it, even if you just clamp it together with the, um, the clamps that are underneath, I don't remember what they're called, but uh, it really just pulls it together and seals it really well. Um, it, it makes a really nice seam and we can do that all the way across. We can request a field joint, it's called, uh, to where you can create almost a seamless top. Now the grain will have a difference, but the seam itself where that grain matches up is like perfect. So we can do that. So if you want to do something that's, um, a little bit more custom, just let us know and we can, we can help you figure that out. I think what we did was probably, you know, a field joint here in the middle for this top so that it would be a little bit more seamless you know field joint here for for that area probably you know i don't remember how we set up this side over here but you know you could do a field joint here before the 1540 and then maybe a field joint after it another field joint before the other 1540 if you wanted to be able to have a consistent single piece for underneath the TV. So we can get pretty creative with that. So just reach out and we can, we can help you with that. All right, guys, that's everything I have for you on this, you know, really cool ATV bike and motorcycle focused uh, garage that we helped Bill put together. You know, just keep in mind the dimensions and, and everything that you need to consider and think about when you're specking out the cabinets for your garage. If you need help doing it, we can we can certainly help you. But I think as we as we continue making more of these videos, really the idea is to teach you how to do it yourself. You know that way you can you can plan out your garage and and have a lot of fun doing that, and utilize the uh, the concepts and the ideas that we talk about in these videos to uh, really make it an awesome space for yourself. Um, like I said, we can design it for you. If you'd, if you'd like to do that, go to the design page on Obsessed Garage, just click on the top banner and click Garage Design. We can spec it out um, and, and really give you all of these plans and 3D drawings and stuff like that. If you're the kind of person that just loves to you know, figure it out yourself, um, hopefully you'll be able to do that through these videos and, and us uh, you know, teaching you how to lay this stuff out, or maybe maybe you'll find some some ideas or things that you haven't considered yet that will uh, you know help it click and allow you to be able to really utilize the store and go on the store and um, you know get what you need. Um, but we're always here if you need any help. So uh, thanks for watching this video. Uh, be on the lookout for more of this style and and more kind of informational how-to styled videos um, 
If you need any help or have any questions, reach out to design at obsessedgarage.com. We'll be happy to uh, get you all sorted out. Thanks, guys.